on run with horses. Uh, running with horses is uh, Phil is guiding us through the book of Jeremiah. We're so fortunate to be able to meet here each week. Uh, thank you, Ceasefire, for hosting us and providing the breakfast for us. Guys, um, Phil's going to step a little bit outside of the box today, um, but I'm going to let him get into that. I, I have not uh, have not shared much about myself to the group as a whole, but uh, I will just say just a little bit this morning to deviate, uh, being today is June 6th. I, I'm a general contractor. I build things. And I've had people ask me, uh, seems like here recently more often than not, um, what do you specialize in? You do medical work, commercial work, residential work, retail work, or office space, or what kind of what kind of buildings do you do? What, what can you tell me about that I've seen that I would recognize in maybe some of your work? That's well, I'm a commercial contractor, except for that house I'm working on right now. I don't do residential work except the house that I'm working on. Um, <laughs> And as far as things that I've built that you may see, <clears throat> I can't really point my finger to anything that you might recognize or, or might see. So, so well, what, I mean, what do you what do you do? And I have really contemplated that question a lot here lately. We're in the process of redoing our company webpage, and that's something that's kind of important to identify our company. What are we about? And I realized a couple of weeks ago um, that this group has had an incredible impact on me. And I realized that it's not the type of building that I specialize in. It's one thing that I specialize in, and that's a relationship. If it's not a relationship that I have with a person that I'm working for, or something that I feel I can develop in a relationship, it's not a project I'm interested in doing. And it doesn't matter if it's a maintenance project, if it's a residential project, or if it's a commercial project. It's the relationships to me that I can point to that I can say, that's what I've been about, or this is what I've been about. And they don't always work out either. Sometimes they go south, but that's just the world that we live in and that's the way things work. But um, this group, this men's group, this round table is about relationships, brotherhood. Charles um, said something this morning. I told him I was gonna steal it when he said it. <clears throat> Matter of fact, I just let Phil take care of that. <clears throat> We'll let, we'll let Phil address that a little later this morning. Guys, let me just open this with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of gathering here. Lord, we thank you so much for the men that are here, for the families that are represented. God, we thank you for Phil, for the preparation he does each week. Lord, we thank you for Ceasefire. Thank you for allowing us to gather here for the breakfast. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for your son who died on the cross, reconciling us to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, this morning, as we continue our series on Run With Horses, um, as Joe uh, mentioned, I'm going to deviate a little bit from what I uh, had planned to do in, in, uh, um, uh, in honor of uh, June 6, 1944. Um, the topic that we're looking at this morning relative to our series in Run With Horses is when do you quit? When do you quit? And my prayer is, is that whatever's going on in your life, you'll be inspired to just dig a little deeper and continue to love and trust uh, uh, the Lord in whatever circumstance or relationship uh, that you're in that's a little bit challenging. And what better way uh, to address uh, not quitting uh, than to honor our, our heroes, uh, the men of the greatest generation um, that landed on Normandy um, 75 years ago today, June the 6th, 1944. So I wanted to, um, to um, offer you uh, a few words by um, General Eisenhower this morning as we begin. May you hear the voice of God. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. You will bring 
about the destruction of the German war machine. The elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe. And security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage devotion to duty and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Be on the alert, stand firm in your faith, act like men, be strong. Words from 1 Corinthians 16, 13, June 6th, 1944. We will not be defeated. We will not quit. As we look this morning um, at Jeremiah, uh, we'll be looking at a passage that um, when we read the account in Jeremiah's life, uh, elicit in me and evoke in me the question, would I have quit at that point? When do you quit? Every man in this room is facing circumstances that are stretching you. I know that because I know uh, the God that we serve and our King, that he is always speaking to us in the context of, of the process of maturing us and conforming us to his image. So no circumstance or no relationship is random, accidental, is purposeful and meaningful. Are you going to quit or will you trust him? Follow with me as we read our introductory paragraph. Run with horses, the pursuit for manhood. Jeremiah 12, 5 says, so Jeremiah, if you're worn out in this foot race with men, what makes you think you can race against horses? God uses that metaphor of racing with horses as the measure of a man. We long to live life to the fullest. We desire to merge freedom and spontaneity with purpose and meaning. Why then do we as men often find our lives boring, adventureless, in fighting addiction to medicate our pain? Or else so busy, so full of chaos, but still devoid of fulfillment. How do we learn to risk, to trust, to pursue wholeness and excellence, to run with the horses in the midst of life? More is known of the life of Jeremiah than any other prophet, and his life is far more significant than his teaching. This study will be a model of manhood as portrayed by the prophet Jeremiah. And as I've mentioned to you in past weeks, you know, uh, Jesus um, asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And the response was, well, some say you're Elijah, and some say you're Jeremiah. Jeremiah's um, model, image, reputation, notoriety was so strong that when Jesus showed up, many people thought that it was the second coming of Jeremiah. We are wise men to study his life and to see Jesus through the life of Jeremiah. So I want you to pick up your pen. Let's go to work. Deliberate, intentional. Engage with me. First question that I want to ask you is, what injustice angers you most? 
what what really gets you riled up that makes you want to fight i i would fight for that i i'll tell you guys um i i have hard time maintaining what little bit of integrity and dignity that i have sometimes when i'm sitting in my counseling office and i'm hearing a story of children being abused uh or wives being abused uh and of course i'm getting paid to help the abuser but believe me i am more concerned about the abusee at that at that point and more than once in my years of counseling i have told the uh, the abusee the abused you need to leave you guys need to at least separate for a period of time get out of there um what you're telling me in my head is abuse that's abuse now i, I just want to use that word i don't use that lightly i don't use that often i don't use it randomly but I'm telling you, that's abuse. And oftentimes, I'm met with wide eyes uh, by the person I'm talking to. It's like, wow, is it really? And that's uh, sadly the MO of those oftentimes being abused. There's like a history of it so much, they don't even realize how bad it is. And I'm trying, um, as a mentor of mine said years ago, Good counseling is nothing more than holding up a mirror and helping people see that which they can't see. And I'm telling you, this is not the house of, of mirrors at the fair to where, you know, you're fat and tall and wide and short and all that. This is reality and you're being abused. And that's an injustice. It's like, guys, what does make you fight? because the antithesis of fighting is quitting. So I want you to understand, is there any fight left in you? If not, you've already quit. You've already quit. You know, eat your chicken and biscuit and go home. Some of you just came for the chicken biscuit anyway, I know. That's it. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff now has permission to do what he wanted to do. All right, second question, second question. What conviction would you die for? What conviction would you die for? I believe that's a question worth considering, worth answering. Certainly, um, grandfathers and fathers, possibly uh, uncles and uh, men that we know and don't know um, died 75 years ago on this day. What would you die for? Um, I want to share just a few comments about uh, D-Day from uh, several men. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Orvington, commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion, says this, quote, Men, I'm not a religious man, and I don't know your feelings in this matter but I'm going to ask you to pray with me for the success of the mission before us. And while we pray, let us get on our knees and not look down, but up with faces, faces raised to the sky so that we can see God and ask his blessing in what we are about to do. God Almighty, in a few short hours, we will be in battle with the enemy. We do not join battle afraid we do not ask favors or indulgence but ask that if you will use us as your instrument for the right and an aid in returning peace to the world we do not know or seek what our fate will be we ask only this that if we die we must that we die as men would die, without complaining, without pleading and safe in the feeling that we have done our best for what we believed was right. O oh Lord, protect our loved ones and be near us in the fire ahead and with us now as we pray to you. All were silent for two minutes 
as the men were left, each with his individual thoughts, and then the colonel ordered, move out, move out. Thank you to our heroes. Winston Churchill said, and what a plan. The vast operation is undoubtedly the most complicated and difficult that has ever occurred. No battle was like the battle that was fought 75 years ago. I mean, the more I hear and the more that you read, and we've seen last week, amazed at just the density and the vast numbers that were involved in that day. Franklin, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt said this, they fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Warvington, commanding officer of the third, but oh, I just read, uh, I just read that. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, Private Claire Golnick, said this, quote, the waiting for history to be made was the most difficult. I spent much time in prayer. Being cooped up made it worse. Like everyone else, I was seasick, and the stench of vomit permeated our craft. Wow. And then General Dwight Eisenhower, quote, this operation is not being planned with any alternatives. This operation is planned as a victory, and that's the way it's going to be. We're going down there, and we're throwing everything we have into it, and we're going to make it a success, unquote. Now, gentlemen, we're using a metaphor that God's given us with horses to inspire us and to encourage us to do the heroic thing. And we can certainly use as a metaphor, as an inspiration, the lives of men who fought. So you and I could be in a setting like this this morning. We are headed into a period of our history that there is a um, possibility that this will not be offered to your grandchildren, will not be possible unless we keep fighting for what God's invited us to fight for, to fight for right and to fight against evil. What conviction would you die for? Third question. Third question. When have you been tempted to quit, but did not? When have you been tempted to quit? And you may be in that situation this morning. And if that's the case, I'm glad you're here and may God speak to your heart. When have you been tempted to quit and did not? When I, when I think about my own life and I think about quitting, I cannot uh, think about that question without thinking about um, when I was taking swimming lessons. You know, I was about eight or nine years old, and my um, mother dropped us off at the city swimming pool and uh, uh, before the pool would open, you know, the public municipal pool in, in um, Elizabethton. That water was cold even on a summer morning, um, and they gave my sister and I swimming lessons. There was about 50 kids, and I'll never forget uh, the morning that uh, must have been about the second morning uh, that, you know, we'd put our face in the water and kicked and got used to, you know, uh, having our face in the water and all that. And then it came time to swim across the pool without looking up. And it, it was so far. It was so far. It was across that pool. And I couldn't raise my head up. And so I'm on the, on the side of the pool, and they say, go. And I start kicking, and I'm, and I'm swimming, and I'm kicking as hard as I can. <laughs> and I come up, and this kid, probably a high school kid then, he's standing there on the pool. He says, dude, you quit. You were almost there. If you'd have just kicked one more, you didn't have to kick. You could have made it. You quit. Dude, I will never forget that. To this day, that makes, makes my gut hurt. 
it's the shame of that. And that changed my life. I mean, I can't say that I've never quit, but I don't ever not remember that moment when this stupid high school kid that was probably 17 years old working at the city pool for his summer job, teaching me how to swim, calling me a quitter. I probably didn't know words at that time that I wanted to call him. I've learned those words since, right? Still, still, the, the, the words didn't change anything, right? You can call him what you want to. I, 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 if I had just kicked one more time, don't quit, guys. Jeremiah, this passage we're going to read out of Jeremiah, invites us not to quit. So turn over to Jeremiah chapter 20. Before we do, Jeff, throw up the um, Psalm 119 passage. Psalm 119 again. I'm feeling terrible. I want to quit. I couldn't feel worse. Get me on my feet again. You promised. Remember, when I told my story, you responded. When I was honest about where I am, I want to quit. I told my story. Train me well in your deep wisdom. Help me understand these things inside and out. Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah's job as a prophet uh, was to pronounce uh, God's truth. He's been preaching in the streets of Jerusalem. Um, and in chapter 19, that I'll read a little bit later, he gives a sermon, and it's a tough sermon. And this is what happens as a result of the sermon. He meets up with Pasher. And Pasher was one of the deputies in the temple. Chapter 20, verse 1. The priest Pasher, son of Immer, was the senior priest in God's temple. He heard Jeremiah preach this sermon, the one in chapter 19. What do you think Pasher thought of Jeremiah's sermon? You know, didn't like it too much. He whipped Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks at the upper Benjamin gate of God's temple. He's locked in the temple jail for preaching God's message. The next day, Pasher came and let him go. And then this, I love this. Jeremiah told him, God has a new name for you. Not pasture, but danger everywhere. Because God says you're a danger to yourself and everyone around you. I mean, Jeremiah still had fight in him. He's been in jail. Pasher could throw him back in the jail. And he says, you're a danger everywhere. You're dangerous. You're bad to the bone. I don't like you. Jeremiah, when do you quit? When do you quit? See, this whole message this morning, again, is, is using Jeremiah as our, as our model. But what it's about is we've got to fight for truth. And I would say fighting for truth both in your life and outside your life. Do you want to know the truth about your life? Do you really want to know the truth about your weaknesses, your blind spots, how unloving that you are to your wife, to your children, to your grandchildren? Are you really committed to the truth? And if you are, then what we've got to do is expose the lies. What lies do you believe this morning that are killing you? Get, get the rocks out of your shoe. It'll make the journey a lot more manageable. The lies that we believe. And then the, the conviction that we have 
hopefully, is to proclaim God. That's what we're talking about. To proclaim God. Don't you want when you die uh, for somebody to say, he fought for all that was right and that people would know God. Um, some of us are headed over to Atlanta uh, this weekend um, to celebrate Ashley Patterson's life, Tyler and Ashley. We'll be over at uh, some park in Powder Springs on Saturday. I am so looking forward to that. My, my heart is broken for Tyler uh, and sad for Ashley's mom and family. She lost her dad a few years ago, but for 40 years, Ashley fought this incredible battle that showed us how to live with an illness that she knew was going to kill her, cystic fibrosis from birth. For 40 years, she lived and taught us all how to live. Nobody that I've ever met, seriously, had the enthusiasm for life that Ashley Patterson has had. But what I can't wait to do is hug my brother Tyler's neck because he taught us how to love. As much as Ashley taught us how to live, he taught guys like me how to love. Because I, you know, I mean, Ron and I are both idiots, you know, and, and, and Ron and I both said, you know, if we were on our first date with Ashley and, you know, about halfway through the date, Ashley tells us her story and she's got cystic fibrosis. I'm such an idiot. I'd have excused myself going to the bathroom and never come back. You know, that's the kind of guy I am. It's, it's like, wow. And, 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 and Tyler just dug in and the more he realized the battle that uh, Ashley was fighting, he just signed up and said, I'm in there with you. I'm in there with you, sweetheart. I'm not going to quit. And you think you've got a hard deal? I, and I wouldn't minimize your hard deal. I've sat with, I've sat with many of you. You do have a hard deal. When are you going to quit? Are you going to quit? I want you to turn over to Jeremiah. Um, chapter eight. Now, again, uh, this this first slide, Jeff. Before we move over to to the passage, um, Northern Kingdom. Um, Jeremiah is in the Southern Kingdom. Uh, he's prophesying uh, before the Babylonians are are to take over uh, all of Jerusalem in the Southern Kingdom. In his message, over and over, return to God. Return to God. As much as my message is about doom and gloom, what I'm saying to you is it's never too late to repent and turn back to God. That was Jeremiah's message. And, and people, all they heard uh, that made them angry was how bad we are. And it's like they, they took it personal. They were offended by Jeremiah, Jeremiah's message. But Jeremiah never gave a message that he didn't give them hope. It's like, dude, all, all you got to do is return to God. We ain't doing that. I mean, that's part of, of, of abusive personalities that I hate is arrogance. And part of the reason I hate it so much is because I see it in myself. I, I have to tell you this funny story. I had a, had a young guy in my office, and he was a whole lot smarter in his own mind than I felt like he was. Okay. And, and I, and I, I, I think I'm hearing him. I'm, I'm doing my best. You know, it's not my first rodeo, you know? And, and I say, you know, could I share um, a, a passage with him? Anytime that I pull out the Bible in my counseling room and I don't know where a guy is, I'll ask permission. I don't just assume that he is into the Bible. You know, I'm trying to be respectful. And um, although I did know uh, that, that this guy was, uh, he was, he's actually a pastor. Okay. And and I and I I um I ask if I could share a particular passage. Oh my goodness, dude! His response pissed me off so bad. I, I mean, upset. I I, I mean, just like okay, you know, I wanted to fight. Okay, and he starts into this theological explanation of that particular passage that I wanted to share, 
and said, you know, I don't really believe that passage is this. And that. I just, I just, I, I actually, I just put my Bible down and I, and I kicked back my chair and I said, okay, you know, I've been there. I've done the seminary thing and all that. And, and I know all those arguments, criticism of that passage and all that. Um, I understand that, but that's not where I'm coming from. And he said, oh, and, and he could tell I was upset. And he said, oh, no, that's okay. I, and I said, no, I, I'm not going to share. You, you've got that figured out. We'll move on to something else. Dude, I was like, dude. It's like, I mean, that was arrogance. Now, part of the reason it upset me so much, because it, it reminded me of me. Been there, done that. It's like, dude, uh, you know, sometimes we hate the very thing that we are. I don't ever want to be that way. Somebody, especially that's 20 or 30 years older than me, uh, wants to share something from God's word, and I'm going to give them some response over some seminary discussion that I heard one time. Dude, that's ridiculous. And that was kind of the posture of the religious leaders toward Jeremiah. They knew more than he did. It actually angered them of the way he was talking to them. They were completely arrogant and stiff-necked about it. So Jeremiah chapter 8, fighting for the truth. Jeremiah says this in the middle of, his, uh, of a sermon. How can you say, we know the score? Again, he, he's talking to these religious leaders. We're the proud owners of God's revelation. It's like, we know it all. We, we own it, and we'll dispense it as we see fit. Look where it's gotten you. Stuck in illusion. Your religion experts have taken you for a ride. You know it all will be unmasked, caught and shown up for what they are. Look at them. They know everything but God's word. Do you call that knowing? No. How condemning can it be? They know everything. Okay, we'll give it to you. You know everything, but God's word. Wow. Guys, I hope somebody says to me, he didn't know much, but he loved God's word. How about that? I hope that's my legacy. So here's what will happen to the know-it-alls. I'll make them wifeless and homeless Everyone's after the dishonest dollar, little people and big people alike, prophets and priests and everyone in between, twist words and doctor truth. My dear daughter, my people, broken, shattered, and yet they put on band-aids saying, it's not so bad, you'll be just fine. But things are not just fine. Do you suppose they're embarrassed over this outrage? Not really. They have no shame. They don't even know how to blush. There's no hope for them. They've hit bottom and there's no getting up. As far as I'm concerned, they're finished. God has spoken. Wow. When are you going to quit? Are you going to keep fighting? Jeremiah kept fighting. And he fought for the peace of God to be in the hearts of those that he loved, and he was trained, he was trained. Angry exasperation kept leading Jeremiah to speak the truth. Anger is not a bad thing. It's just that when we allow anger to be our source of power, then we become abusive. Anger is intended to help us to rise up and fight with a power beyond our own, a power greater than ours, and his name is Jesus. And we bring peace and the training from God's word to the gunfight. So what we have to do is expose the lies. Turn over to, to Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19, and again, This is a sermon that Jeremiah preached. Jeremiah 19, God said to me, go buy a clay pot 
Then get a few leaders from the people and a few of the leading priests and go out to the valley of Benjamin, just outside of the pot shed gate and preach here, preach there what I tell you. Say, listen to God's word, you kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is the message from God of the angel armies, the God of Israel. I'm about to bring doom crashing down on this place. Oh, and will ears ever ring doom because they've walked off and left me and made this place strange by worshiping strange gods. God's never heard of by them, their parents or the old kings of Judah doom because they have massacred innocent people. Now, gentlemen, this, this is an uncomfortable passage for me to read because I love our country. I love where we are. But, dude, this, this is like contemporary. When you start massac massac massacring innocent people, babies, they, they were worshiping um, the destruction of babies in their idol worship. God was angry, and Jeremiah was bringing that message to them, and they didn't like it. Doom because they built altars to that no God Baal and burned their own children alive in the fire as offerings to Baal, an atrocity I've never ordered, never so much as hinted at. Wow. That's what was happening. Innocent lives destroyed. Does that not make you shudder? That's abuse. And so it's payday and soon God's decree. This place will no longer be known as Topheth or Valley of Ben-Hinnon, but Massacre Meadows. I'm canceling all the plans Judah and Jerusalem had for this place, and I'll have them killed by their enemies. I'll stack their dead bodies to be eaten by carrion crows and wild dogs. I'll turn this city into such a museum of atrocities that anyone coming near will be shocked speechless by the savage brutality. The people will turn into cannibals, dehumanized by the pressure of the enemy siege. They'll eat their own children. Yes, they'll eat one another family and friends alike say all this and then smash the pot in front of the men who have come with you and then say this is what God of the angel army says I'll smash this people in this city like a man who smashes a clay pot into so many pieces it can never be put together again they'll bury bodies here in Topheth until there's no more room and the whole city will become a Topheth. The city will be turned by people and kings alike into a center for worshiping the star gods and goddesses, turned into an open grave, the whole city an open grave, stinking like a sewer, like Topheth. Wow. Those are hard words to hear, hard words to read. And then Jeremiah left Topheth, where God had sent him to preach the sermon and took his stand in the court of God's temple and said to the people, this is the message from God of the angel armies to you. Warning, danger, I'm bringing down on this city and all the surrounding towns the doom that I have pronounced. They're set in their ways and won't budge. They refuse to do a thing I say. Expose the lies expose the lies. Guys, before we read this last uh, portion, I want to show you again some uh, clips out of June 14th or June 6th, 1944. And again, I hope it inspires you to not quit, to fight in the way that our grandfather's fault, our father's fault for something greater than ourselves. May you hear the voice of God. Well, D-Day was a, obviously the most important single 
fight of that war. And of course, had we lost it, there's no telling what the outcome would have been. Since the American entry into the war, American generals had been agitating for an opportunity to fight the Germans directly. The D-Day invasion, the invasion of Normandy in June 1944, represented the cutting edge of this offensive. The essential condition that underwrote the success of D-Day was the fact that Germany had been bled virtually to death by fighting on the Eastern Front uh, for several years against the Red Army and the Soviet Union before D-Day ever happened. The Germans had been preparing for this invasion as long as the Americans and the British had been, and they had been digging in, and they knew that they could inflict appalling casualties on the first units ashore. Well, somebody had to do it. And so the soldiers went, and indeed, those first units did suffer very high rates of death and wounding. It's one thing to go on a beach with sand dunes. It's something else when you've got enemy on top of these bluffs. And for some reason, our naval gunnery was either off or something went wrong there. They couldn't destroy those gun emplacements. But eventually, the weight of the invasion took hold. The numbers of Americans, the numbers of craft, allowed the Americans and the British to establish a beachhead. And once they established a beachhead, then they could bring more and more soldiers and equipment ashore. One thing I don't think either the Japanese or the Germans really counted on was what it meant to come up against a massive capitalist industrial power. The ability to build stuff on a massive scale with massive numbers was just something they hadn't really anticipated. If you look back at the old photographs and the footage of that armada out there off the coast of the I don't think they've ever assembled before or after anything like that. Eventually, it was the technology, it was the weight of American weapons that tipped the balance. But at the very beginning, it was the soldiers, the ones who splashed ashore, the ones who knew that in the first wave, lots and lots of them would never come back. And those are the ones who made possible everything that followed. The rangers who went in first and the waves that came after them stood right up to it. There was more bravery that day than one can hardly imagine. Don't quit. Don't quit. Brave men have gone before you. What you're facing is real. It's significant. I would sit with you and sit in the challenge that you face, but I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to make excuses. I want you to love, be loved, and trust God. Turn over to Jeremiah 20. As I read earlier, Pasher hears this sermon of doom. He's the deputy in the temple, and he throws Jeremiah in jail. Now, at that point, do you quit? Do I quit? I would have certainly thought about it. Absolutely. You know, this is the end. This is my doom. And I love after Jeremiah gets out of uh, jail, he just looks at Pasher and says, you're danger everywhere. You're danger everywhere. And just yells at him, dude, he'll throw you back in jail. Pick up where we left off. All your friends are going to get killed in battle while you stand there and watch. What's more, I'm turning all of Judah over to the king of Babylon to do whatever he likes with them. Haul them off into exile, kill them at whim. Everything worth anything in this city, property and possessions, along with everything in the royal treasury, I'm handing it all over to the enemy. 
they'll rummage through it and take what they want back to Babylon. And you, Pasher, you and everyone in your family will be taken prisoner into exile. That's right, exile in Babylon. You'll die and be buried there, you and all your cronies to whom you preached your lies. Dude, he'll throw you back in jail. He'll throw you, shh, shh, shh Jeremiah, shh. Mm -mm. You pushed me into this, God. Now, now this is interesting. This, this is where it turns. So, so Jeremiah gets out of the shadow of Pasher. Uh, I mean, he's been bold, and now he's upset with God. Now, listen to this. This is this is shows just the humanity of Jeremiah. You pushed me into this, God, and, and I let you do it. You were too much for me, and now I'm a public joke. They're all poking fun at me every time I open my mouth. I'm shouting murder or rape, and I'll get. And all I get from my God warnings are insults and contempt. But if I say, forget it, no more God messages from me, the words are fire in my belly. I can't stop. There's fire in my belly, a burning in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it any longer. Then I hear whispering behind my back. There goes old danger everywhere. Shut him up. Report him. Old friends watch and hoping I'll fall flat on my face, one misstep, and we'll have him. We'll get rid of him for good. They're making fun of him. There goes old danger everywhere. They they turn around what he said to Pasher on him, and they're calling him old danger everywhere. When do you quit? When do you quit? But God, a most fierce warrior, is at my side. Those who are after me will be sent sprawling, slapstick balloons falling all over, themselves a spectacle of humiliation no one will ever forget i i love the struggle in jeremiah it it encourages me because it's it's the struggle that's in me and it's in you i want to quit i can't quit i'm going to quit no i can't i can't quit back and forth i'm mad at god oh i love god it's it's real Oh, God of the angel armies, no one fools you. You see through everyone, everything. I want to see you pay them back for what they've done. I rest my case with you. Sing to God, all praise to God. Oh, my goodness, he breaks into a worship service. Isn't that great? He saves the weak from the grip of the wicked. Cursed the day I was born, the day my mother bore me. A curse on it, I say. A curse the man who delivered the news to my father. You've got a new baby, a baby boy. How happy it made him. Let that birth notice be blacked out, deleted from the records. And the man who brought it haunted to his death with the bad news he brought. He should have killed me before I was born. With that womb as my uh, tomb. My mother pregnant for the rest of her life with a baby dead in her womb. Why, oh, why did I ever leave that womb? Life's been nothing but trouble and tears. And that's what's coming, and what's coming is more of the same. Wow, so real. It's your journal. It's my journal. I love you, Jesus. I was just kidding. I wish I'd never been born. It's the journey of life. Quit telling lies to yourself or to others. If it hurts, it hurts. If you want to quit, acknowledge it, but don't. Doesn't, doesn't everybody need somebody to put an arm around them at some point and say, dude, I'm with you. Stay in the fight. Don't quit. Don't quit. We all do. Jeremiah is such a great model. But you got to be a truth teller, an exposer of lies, and be committed to proclaiming God above all else. close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for our time this morning, for your word, for the model of Jeremiah, for the model of Jesus. Um, Father, I pray that every man here would take the challenges before him, people challenges and circumstantial challenges, and turn that in to an invitation for you to have your way in our life. Thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.